Welcome, 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 guys, once again to Making Hay with JRA, coming to you every Tuesday and Thursday from 12 noon to 1 Eastern Time, where we discuss uh, helping you grow, start, and grow and start a junk removal business. Uh, we've, uh, we, this is Lee Godbold with Junk Removal Authority. Uh, been in business with our junk removal company, Junk Doctors, for about seven years, going on eight years now. And we've built it up to a pretty sizable company. We've made a lot of mistakes along the way. We've done quite a bit right, we've done quite a bit wrong, and we're trying to help you avoid those mistakes. You can always check us out at junkra.com. Uh, check our services out that we do. We've also got a lot of great free information at junkra.com. Hit the 1,000 subscriber mark today, Aaron. Did you see that? I did, that's hit 1, awesome. 000. So I mean, that's great. That's still a small little piddly number, but please subscribe below. If you like what you're seeing throughout this show, please subscribe. Uh, and that way you get notifications every time we go live or put out additional content. So if you guys have any questions or comments, please leave it in either the YouTube comment section or the Facebook comment section. We'll be happy to answer any questions you have throughout this episode. Um, today, what we're going to be talking about is something that is actually one of the most searched for things when it comes to the junk removal business. Now, this is mainly pertaining to people that are a bit new in the business or looking to get in business. It can also be pertaining to uh, those of you that might have been in business a while, you think you've reached a peak with your company in terms of sales, and you're no longer setting high goals, this also is going to pertain to you. And that is how much money can you make with your junk removal business? Out of all the videos we've put out in the past, this one, uh, this one video had the most views, and uh, obviously it's got a whole lot of interest in it. So the first thing before you can really understand how much money can truly be made in junk removal is you need to understand is there needs to be an understanding of why you got into it and typically we found there's there's a few reasons there's about four different reasons that people actually or four different types of people that uh, that get into junk removal number one you've got the people that just enjoy the junk and there's a lot of people out there they enjoy uh, going to searching for treasures basically so they go to go to homes and um, and they look through they look through the stuff that they remove they come across a lot of great antique items uh, we got a signed football uh, from the Green Bay Packers. First ever Super Bowl, we got that signed football. The entire team is written on it. It's in my house right now. And uh, I, I never, I've, I've never gotten rid of the thing. I've looked at values. It's, it's probably about a $7,000 ball now. When I first got it a few years back, it was about a $5,000 ball. It's got Vince Lombardi's signature, clear as can be on it. Uh, that's probably been the coolest find that we've had. We've got some, a lot of other neat stuff as well. But I'm not somebody that just enjoys going through the junk. That wasn't my aspiration. But there are a lot of people that get into this business that do that. The second reason is they like the work and they believe it's a great supplemental income. So my mom, when I first got into this business, she, she was telling me, she said, well, you still need to go to school and, and uh, you know, get, get, a, get a degree and everything because you know, this, this junk stuff is a great supplemental income uh, or secondary income, but it's not a career. And uh, I, I made, my, my parents made pretty good money, but uh, my company made far exceeds what they ever made. Um, you know, their, in their entire working career. So, uh, but there's a lot of people out there, if you think that you're getting into this business just for that secondary, just to, as a secondary income, you're gonna cap, you're gonna put a cap on the level of success you're gonna have. Maybe you're not interested in growing it, and that's fine. So, uh, but, but when I talk about how much money you can make in your junk removal business uh, later on in this episode, it's gonna be mainly pertaining to the next two categories. So the next category is, is like a young entrepreneur, a new entrepreneur. Um, they get into this business because it's fairly low capital and it doesn't require a whole lot of technical skills. That was me. So I, didn't, I, you know, I was a roller skating manager or supervisor before at a lo local roller skating rink. Um, I, I was good at saving up money. I probably had fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 saved up, what was left that I didn't blow when I was racing and uh, racing cars. Then I took that money and, and I had a pickup truck already and a trailer already and I got in business. It was low technical skills. I always aspired to grow a really, you know, a large company and I just got in there and kind of figured it out along the way. That's not necessarily the ideal way, but that's the only way that was available to me because I didn't have capital going into it. So the, the, the fourth type of person is somebody that's already been successful. Could have been a corporate job. It could have been they've already run successful businesses in the past. We just had some guys that bought our business package that have run uh, this. Uh, he has a very he had a very successful car dealership. He just recently stole. He uh, sold, and he uh, 
he is still in the car business some, but he's looking for another business to get into. He's got a, lot, a big advantage over a lot of people that are not in that situation because he's got capital. He's got money to spend on advertising. He had money to spend on training by purchasing a business package uh, from us. And he's done it before. He knows it takes money to make money, and he's got the confidence to spend that money to get the returns. And that's something that's really critical. So it's, it's, it's critical that if you are a, a, the number three, if you're that young entrepreneur that's getting in the business because of the low technical skills, is that you transition to a successful business owner over a period of time. So you get confidence built up over a period of time, and you're always willing to kind of reinvest to get more out of it. What kind of questions we got, Aaron? Uh, doesn't look like any questions have come in yet. Okay. Um, we do have a couple people watching. We got Coastal Hauling and Junk Removal commenting here. How's it going, Coastal Hauling? Uh, where are you guys located? All right. Uh, while, Co while Coastal appreciate you watching, while he uh, we'll wait back on his response, we'll kind of move on down. Um, the third category we were talking about, so that young entrepreneur, that new entrepreneur, could be something somebody that's really seeking massive success. Uh, but they come up short due to lack of discipline and they give up with pushback. So uh, th I've been guilty of this in the past and this is something that's really learned. It's really a learned muscle to become disciplined when it comes to running your business. It's so often uh, an entrepreneur really survives on instinct and uh, instinct is a great thing, but instinct can also steer you wrong from time to time or what you think is, is how people, so doing something and thinking it's going to have a certain effect or tr choosing uh, type of advertising or changing your website around, making all these kind of uncalibrated changes because you think it's the right thing to do, oftentimes screws you up. When you get slow, you all of a sudden change what you've been doing that works all the time. So for example, if you've been doing Google ads and Google ads all of a sudden doesn't bring you a lot of, much business over a three or four day span, don't stop doing Google ads. Um, and don't necessarily, even on Google ads, if it's been successful and all of a sudden it, it's not as successful for you for a period of time, that doesn't necessarily mean you spend money, more money immediately on it. If your rankings haven't changed, you're probably just going through a, a, a slower cycle. A lot of people make mistakes when they go through a slower cycle by, uh, by varying what they've got going on. Um, the other thing is you've got to really, really study your numbers. So you need to know your expense percentages you need to know your customer acquisition cost. And we talk about this in previous episodes of, junk, of Making Hay with JRA. Those two numbers, you need to know what your percentage of income is on going out on disposal fees, what your percentage is for payroll, your percentage is for fuel, your percentage for insurance, vehicle wear and tear. You need to know all, all of that in order to be able to properly evaluate how profitable your business is. And then you need to know, again, that customer acquisition cost. How much money is it costing you to get one customer? Ideally, if you can break it down to how much a Google customer costs, how much a Home Advisor customer costs, how much a Yelp customer costs, Craigslist, so on and so forth. Uh, you want to understand that that cost as well because that's going to allow you to really expand. So you want to make sure you know those numbers and you make rational decisions. Again, guys, your gut is normally right, but making a small change based on a goal, make a small change based on a gut feeling if you'd like, but then monitor the results. Put testing in place to see if that's actually making a difference. Don't go all in until you feel pretty certain that the, the route you're taking is correct. At that point, you go freaking all in 100%. Uh, the fourth guy, again, has the greatest chance of success. They've done it before. They have the money to pay for the guidance, and they have the extra money to invest in good equipment, good people, and a lot of advertising. And that last thing I just mentioned, advertising, that is critical to this business. Everybody needs to understand if they're trying to attain maximum income in junk removal, you're not in the junk removal business, you're in the marketing and advertising business. And until you understand that, you're gonna hamper your success. Junk removal just happens to be what you do if you're looking for massive success. If you're somebody that just enjoys junk, that's great, this, this doesn't necessarily apply to you. But if you're trying to build up a multi-million dollar a year company, it's going to require you to have the understanding that you are in the marketing business. Nothing you do is revolutionary when it comes to junk. You don't have some product or service out there that's never been seen before. Um, you know, this is a, getting to be a, a much more established brand than it used to be. When 1-800-GOT-JUNK started, when Brian Scudamore started with 1-800-GOT-JUNK, he was able to get a lot of great free press because it was crazy to people that people actually uh, you know, that this business existed, that you actually went and removed people's junk. You can still get some press now, but it's much more difficult because this is a much more established industry. College Hunks has established it. Uh, junk King, or uh, Got Junk has established it. 
So you really need to get out there and, and, and market as hard as you can, and that is gonna require spending some money. Um, those of you in position three, those young entrepreneurs, be very careful who you take your advice from. Uh, you wanna take your advice from somebody that has attained the level of success you're going after. Uh, you don't want people at your current level or at the or at a level beneath you because they're going to give you advice to help you get to the level they're at, which you might already be at. You want to take advice from people that have done more than you have and are where you'd like to go. And it's absolutely critical. Again, guys, you move into that fourth stage where you have built up a business that's making great money and that you continually are about making rational decisions and you're investing in training and investing in advertising uh, moving forward. Before we get on to how much money can a, a junk removal business actually can make, we got any questions or comments we need to cover? Guys, always are happy to evaluate websites too, evaluate websites, we can give some pricing recommendations, that's always something that we'll do uh, a, a little bit of throughout, throughout the day, throughout this episode. Yeah, we've got a question from Jonathan on Facebook. Um, he says, I have a few clients try to tell me that the items can be resold and use that as a bargaining chip. How do you remove that aspect while talking with the customer? Yeah, I mean, we, just let them, we just let them know we don't resell them. So we say, yeah, I mean, certainly if you've got some stuff that could be resold, uh, you know, you might, you yourself might want to get on Craigslist or Facebook buy, sell, trade, list them for sale and sell them on your own. Uh, that isn't what we do. What we do is we come out to you and we help you get rid of those items extremely fast. And then if they can be donated, we'll take them off to a donation center and send you the donation receipt. So that's, that's how we approach that. At, this, at the moment, we don't have an active resale business. Uh, we might get into that model a bit more. So if you're reselling, if you already are reselling, then you just let the individual know, say, hey, you, again, you're welcome to list it for sale on your own, and you can meet the people, and you can sell it, and you can get some money off of it. But the business we are in is coming out and helping you get rid of those items as quickly as possible so you don't have to worry about it. We good? Okay. So how much money can a junk removal business truly make? Um, we built Junk Doctors up into a, a $2 million plus a year business in about five and a half years is kind of when we hit, hit that mark. So uh, we, the, what we give you, we've actually done, but there was a lot of stuff we did incorrectly. So one of the things we did incorrectly with building Junk Doctors up to a multi-million dollar a year company is we expanded geographically too fast. We should have actually focused in on our main market, our original market, Raleigh first and just spent all of our, our investment in advertising dollars and, and trucks, vehicles, people, recruiting more, more guys, which is really tough to hire. That should have been focused in a much smaller market than we did. And even when we were in Raleigh, we started out with a 50 mile radius. We probably should have started out with about a 20 or 25 mile radius, advertise extremely hard in that smaller radius, and then move to the larger radius over time as we got more trucks, more capital, more people, which would allows us to break it down into individual zones. That's how you maximize profit. Instead, we were doing this really large radius and we might be on the northeast corner. We might go down to the southeast corner on the next job. We might be at the northwest corner on the following job and we're running all over the place. It's a very inefficient way to do it. And you're also, you're missing out. If you're much more focused on a smaller area, you're missing out on, on that potential. So one of the biggest things of advice I can give people is start if you have an area with a decent population, have a smaller service area, if, as long as it's your target market too. So that doesn't necessarily mean it's a radius around your office. You might pick, there might be, a, your office might be in an area that doesn't have the ideal junk removal customer. And that ideal customer is gonna be a, a upper middle income, upper income individual generally, or on the opposite end, you've got an area with a lot of uh, low, lower income housing. If you can reach those landlords, the property owners that own that, the property managers, then there's a lot of business to be had there. But I would focus your advertising efforts on an area that has a lot of your potential customers, which is again, that middle income to upper income individual, uh, decent property values, they own decent stuff and they have the income to replace that stuff. Focus your advertising efforts at that place and then expand out as you grow and as you, gain, as you get more people and more equipment. So, sales potential. These numbers, uh, there's people that have been in business that might be listening to this episode, they might have been in business three, four, five, six years, and you're not gonna hit the figure that I'm gonna throw out here on year one. And again, this is a figure, there's people we work with right now that are on pace to hit this very first figure in year one. That's $200,000 gross. 
Now, when we project gross, uh, when you, if you're looking to buy one of our business packages, and again, guys, we do not sell franchises here. We sell all the training. You get operations manuals, you get the video training, you get on-site, you get consulting and training here, and then you get ongoing training for up to a year included in that package. It's not a franchise, but the guys that come to us looking to buy that package, we normally don't project 200000 in year one, but in all honesty, that's we, you know that that is something that the guys we were working with are are trending on hitting. So, uh, two hundred thousand dollars in year one gross. Now again, guys, this is gross. So we're going to cover net here in a minute. So net's what's going to be left over. Year two, doubling is not unheard of. Your first three years in junk removal. So College Hunks did it with their Washington D.C. location. I don't remember the exact numbers. I think they did four hundred thousand in their first year, something like that. They did eight hundred thousand in their second year, and they hit a million over you know over a million, million and a half, million six in their third year. My numbers could be off there. Maybe it was 300, 600, 1.2. But anyway, they doubled year over year. Junk doctors, we doubled year over year most years. But again, we made a lot of mistakes along the way. So there was a couple years in there we only grew by 50%. Um, so 200,000 year one. Guys, year two, 400,000. Totally doable. It's going to take you two trucks to hit 400,000 in revenue. Um, figure you can hit, depending on your market and your pricing, one truck, one dump truck, one dump truck, can hit somewhere between 250 to 300 uh, per truck. So to get to 400,000, you're gonna be running a crew and a half pretty consistently. Um, year three, doubling again, guys. Year three, $800,000, totally doable. Uh, when we send out projections, if you approach this about a business package, we're gonna project 50% growth because we try and be very conservative. Uh, doubling year over year over year and having $800,000 business by year three is totally doable. Now, again, guys, this can change. If you're in North Carolina, that figure is going to be different than in your New York City. In New York City, you're going to charge more. So your New York City, you know, these numbers could be even higher. Uh, New York City is a very competitive market. So there's a lot of stuff you're going to have to do. And if you're in a smaller market than, North, than, than the Raleigh area, these gross numbers can be lower, but what you're going to find is your net numbers can actually be higher. You can have higher profit margins in a smaller area because it's your acquisition cost goes down. Year four, that, that growth, that doubling growth, if you're still in the same market, can uh, can definitely subside. 1.2 million year four, 1.5 million year five. And uh, this is totally doable because if you look at 1-800-GOT-JUNK, 1-800-GOT-JUNK sales, um, they're, they're franchise-wide sales, which I think were, it was about $300 million last year. Now, that is all their brands. That's their Move brand. That's their Got Junk brand. That's the painting brand and the uh, window cleaning uh, or, or power washing brand. So that's four brands doing $300 million, I believe. Again, guys, my figures might be a little off here. Uh, of that, Got Junk, and this is my estimation, Got Junk is going to be at least 200 of that, probably like 230 because the other brands are much newer. If I'm way off, somebody correct me if you guys know better. But there's about 170 Got Junk franchises out there. So that alone right there, that tells you if you got 200, if you got 230 million, you got 170 franchises, that means that these franchises are averaging over a million dollars. Now you're gonna have some that might do a half million or 750 or something like that. You're gonna have some that do 10 million. But making this big type money is totally possible in junk removal. Um, the profit potential on this, the only way you're going to attain these numbers is an extremely aggressive advertising model. So, I mean, we project on our business package customers, first year in business, we recommend they spend 25 to 30% of their income back out in advertising. And it's under multiple, multiple avenues. So, uh, you know, Google ads, we're always big on Google ads, but guys, let me tell you something, Google ads does not work in 100% of markets. So if you're in a market where Google Ads is not the way to go for you, then you need to uh, you need to figure out what it is. So you need to try out Yelp. In California, Yelp is, can be huge. Yelp is gonna take up a tremendous amount of time, but Yelp, there's a lot of business to be had in Yelp. That doesn't mean you abandon Google Ads, but that means maybe you don't budget quite as much for it in the area if your acquisition cost is higher. You maybe you maybe don't go after that real top spot, which is really expensive. You figure out what works. Home Advisor works in certain areas. Home Advisor in California, you can't even do Home Advisor in California because for some reason or another, they've got it grouped into, or it's, it's difficult to do it, they've got it grouped into um, like debris removal, construction debris removal, which requires a license, typical California. Um, uh, Google, Facebook ads, we are finding Facebook ads can be huge. Matter of fact, Aaron, are we able to show this rebranded video that we, we did for Junksmiths? Should, we... should be able to, it may have some lag, but we'll see. Okay, so guys, this right here, brand new service we, we just added in. We develop videos, Facebook advertising videos 
for junk removal. Um, we, we, use our, we use our own company and we're actually able to rebrand it. So the video that Aaron's gonna show you here, assuming it doesn't lag, um, is a, actually a junk doctor's truck and a junk doctor's uh, shirt. It's, it's, a, it, it's junk doctor's employees, but we've rebranded it to Junk Smith's, which is in Huntington Beach. So Aaron, let's see if this, this commercial works. All right, don't hit me if it doesn't. Um, to Junk Smiths. Bear with me one moment while you get this pulled up. This is an entire campaign also, guys. So this is not just uh, a commercial. So we actually include a, a landing page. You're going to have a landing page at, once they click on it from Facebook. Um, there will be a landing page that'll have, it's going to be branded. We're calling this guy Mr. Junk. So it's going to have Mr. Junk on it. And then it's going to have a squeeze to get people's email addresses. It's going to say, enter in your email address to get a coupon sent off to you that you can use at, you know, at any point for service. And we're going to do $50 off. You could do $20 off, 30 off, 10% off, whatever. And then the next thing we're going to do is enter in your address to get entered for uh, a chance to win up to a full truckload of junk removal, removed for free, as well as we're going to send you a refrigerator magnet with Mr. Junk. This magnet is going to be rebranded for your company. So it's gonna have your logo on it. It's essentially your commercial. And then we have a monthly rate we're gonna charge for these. Um, is, it, is it working yet or I need to play it on here? Let's try one more time. Try one more time, okay, cool. We might have it loaded at this point. Let's lock this down. I'm real TV. You've been using me since 2000. I'm a peer with the third grade art projects. It's too big. Okay. All right, so we get we get to keep rolling. Yeah. Okay. So, all right, guys. So I'm so we were afraid that was going to happen. So we're just going to play on the screen. Is uh, camera good on the screen there? Let's see how loud this is. I'm your old tube TV. You haven't used me since 2005. Now I'm up here with your third grade art projects. They suck. Let's face it, I'm in the way. This isn't working for either of us. But if you call junk smiths, they'll be out within 24 hours to take me off your hands. So get me out no matter where I'm hiding. So load me up and take me where I belong. Give us a call today. To get rid of me for good? Okay, so the Junk Doctors version of that had uh, 40,000 views in one week. And then we have paused the paid campaign on it until the landing pages and everything else is fully developed. That should be done in the next few days. So again, guys, contact us at 919-617-1975 if interested in that commercial service. Facebook advertising is one of the new ways to go if you run it correctly. Uh, we're seeing great results now from Facebook ads. It does take a few months. It's a bit of branding to it, but awesome results on Facebook ads. Um, when we go back with this campaign, we're going to spend about 100 bucks a day. The nice thing is you can spend $20 a day or $10 a day or $5 a day, whatever you want to spend. What you'll do is you'll start out at a lower daily spend, say it's 10 bucks a day. And then once you actually start getting jobs from it, which could be a month or two in, two in the future, once you start getting consistent jobs from it, you begin bringing that up, which is in turn kind of bring more potential business to you again over a bit of time. There's definitely a branding aspect to Facebook, but the nice thing is you can set an exact budget. Before we move on to the next thing, which is going to be net profits, we got any questions at all?
Awesome. Okay. Guys, again, any questions you have, you want us to look at websites, whatever you need, just uh, please post in the comment section. We'll be happy to get to them. So profit potential, guys, if you do year one, if you're heavy advertising, 25% of your income goes back out in the form of advertising and your pricing set correctly. This is one thing we're going to cover here in a minute is your pricing has to be high enough for this to work. Otherwise, you're going to be dead in the water. So your very first year net profit, you might see around $30,000. So uh, not, not great. That might be high. Could be 20 could be 40 but somewhere right in the middle, you're probably going to be somewhere around $30,000 depending on your exact market. Uh, that's on $200,000 gross. Year two at $400,000, seeing a $50,000 or so profit is totally doable. Um, this, this number here, your cash flow could be more or less. So your cash flow is the actual cash that comes in and out of your business. Um, you're going to need a second truck. So year two, for sure, you're going to need a second truck and second vehicle. Uh, a lot of that, the principal pay down doesn't go against profit, but it does go against your cash flow. So keep that in mind. So guys, I'm talking, if you want to do this, if you want to really blow up and have a huge business, I am talking in your first couple of years, not making a whole lot of money. So you're going to have to live really, really cheap. And, uh, you know, hopefully maybe you got some income coming in from somewhere else. Maybe you have some money saved up you're able to kind of dip into. Uh, maybe your wife uh, or your or your husband. Uh, if, if, if uh, there are some female junk removal entrepreneurs out there, uh, maybe they've got an income coming in to help supplement this so you can reinvest most of it back in your company. If you're relying on your junk removal business to give you an income, it's going to hamper this growth. Um, we did, but I will tell you several years ago, it was cheaper to do what we did. So uh, Google ads, we were able to really just kill it with Google ads. We were one of the first companies to really start doing it in junk removal, especially aggressively. And, um, you know, it's, it's gotten much more competitive. We also have, we're also seeing trends um, that, you know, Google Ads is getting a bit more expensive as far as acquisition costs. So we're, that's the reason Facebook ads, you know, we're always trying to stay a step ahead of the game. So even though ads, you want to be doing Google Ads, we're also moving into Facebook ads to make sure that if this Google thing, if the results start to drop off, that we're already well established in Facebook. So year three, um, $120,000 on $800,000 worth of income net. So now we're talking about making some good, decent money. Maybe this isn't 120, maybe it's 80 net, maybe it's 140, but you see kind of the average I'm bringing out, what is possible, what we have seen about $120,000 or so net. Year four, that's when we start with talking big money, guys. 240, 240 uh, net on 1.2 gross, and year five, 300 net on 1.5. Now. Some of you guys are in markets where no, you're not going to do 1.5 million. You're not going to do 1.2 million with, with just junk removal. So what you have to do is once you've kind of, once you've realized you've hit sort of your peak and you need to make sure it's your peak, you, you ain't hit your peak if you're not doing, you know, five or six different methods of advertising, spending 15% of, of your gross income. Once you're established 15% of your gross income going back out and advertising, you haven't hit your peak. So um, a lot of people think they've hit their peak before they really have. So if you're in larger markets, this or in more expensive markets, uh, some of these numbers could be higher. So again, guys, this is all about averages, what we have seen to be possible, what we ourselves have done, um, more or less. So now this is in one single market. One of the mistakes I mentioned is we expanded out to too many markets too quick. So we hit, by year five, we exceeded this number here, but our net was not as good as, as what we project because we got too big too fast start a smaller market, saturate that market the best you can, then move into additional locations or additional services. So we got any questions? All right. Chances of additional income with junk removal, there are plenty of them. Everybody, when the most, what most people think is the resale end of it. Resale needs to be done at two ends of your business or at two different stages of your business. The very first stage, when you first start, you resell. And this could be for a real short period of time. The other stage is once you've become more established and you have a lot more volume. Now, the only time that you are in between this and reselling is if you are the that fourth type of entrepreneur that I was talking about, somebody that has extra money saved up or they're able to borrow extra money and they're willing to do so, then at that point, it's not bad to do resale and something else I'm about to mention right from the start. You go out, you get a good sized warehouse facility, uh, you get a good, with a little office in it, and you start reselling the stuff. So you, you list it on Facebook, you list it on Facebook, buy, sell, trade. I love setting up a store. Guys, I, I've, I've brought this up before. This is a company in Asheville, North Carolina. It's called 
Looks like our cast has quit working again. We gotta get where this cord works. Um, bear with me, guys. This thing's called the Regeneration Station. Feel free to look this thing up because it's not gonna pull up. What the Regeneration Station is, is it is a 30,000 square foot facility in Asheville, North Carolina, started by a junk removal company called Junk, I think it's Junk Recyclers. Uh, they're about a four truck operation. And he started it out of, a, I think like a, like a 30 by 30 storage facility. And he's built this up to this massive 30,000 square foot uh, facility. And they, in addition to selling the stuff they get, they also have set it up as like a flea market consignment store combination. And um, this is, uh, uh, so where they're actually renting out booth space. The nice thing is what, what that does is they actually get a tremendous amount of foot traffic. So they get a lot of people. We flew out to Asheville about three months ago to check this place out. There's a lot of foot traffic. People come in and they browse through all the different items that are there. They buy stuff that came from junk jobs and they buy stuff that came from other vendors and then they're making a, a, a they're making a percentage of that in consignment as well if you're going to do this facility you need early on especially or actually period if, when you're ready to do this facility you need to go all in on it you need a good a good size facility uh, I you know you can start out selling your own stuff but eventually I do recommend you get a big enough place you can do this flea market consignment type deal because that is in turn going to allow you to get all this extra traffic in which is going to help you move your other stuff so, uh, only time you do it in between the new stage, when you need to do it in the new stage because you have the extra time, you need the extra income. And the established stage, you start doing it in the established stage because you have enough volume to make it worth it for you. In the middle, there's not enough volume for you to make great money on, this, on, on, on the resale end. What happens is it's distracting you from your core business, which is getting paid to remove these items. So instead, when you get good stuff in the middle, you can recycle what you can and get great money off of, you donate what you can, and a lot of stuff gets dumped. I'm not one of these guys that's gonna sit here and tell you, these junk removal companies always try and tell you they're gonna recycle 60% of what they bring in. Our goal is to get to even higher than that here soon. It, you're, you're not gonna do it and make the, your maximum profits we're into the bottom end because you don't have enough volume to do so. Focus on getting as much removal done and getting paid for it. The other stuff is kind of secondary, unless again, you've got that extra money and where you can hire somebody to assist you on selling the stuff and beginning this type of store from the beginning and you're investing heavily in advertising on your junk removal company which is going to bring in more volume for your store something and then recycling i'm going to put in along in that same lines there's great money to be made in recycling but again you're in the junk removal business uh, if you get a great load of metal take it to the scrap yard if you get a lot of copper and all put it to the side take it off and scrap it but you know, you need to understand you need to be getting paid to take the stuff. You don't want to get in the business of being a scrapper and expecting to go out and get stuff for free um, as well because all of a sudden this model, this, this getting paid and this picking stuff up for free, they don't blend very well together. The other thing, the third thing, is a rage room. And we are looking for a very large facility um, right in our main area where we can do a store, flea market like that, a rage room, and then what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna bring all of our stuff back. So all of our stuff back is gonna come back to a central sorting area, think of it as our own transfer station. We're gonna go through everything, we're gonna recycle the maximum amount we can, we're gonna resell what we can, and a lot of stuff's gonna go into that rage room where people pay us to come in and basically beat the shit out of stuff that we got paid to remove. So all of a sudden you're able to get money on the removal end and you're able to get money on the other end. But a rage room in between, uh, or actually a rage room until you're in that, that, la that, that growth stage where you have at least say four trucks running consistently, maybe three, three, four trucks, it's difficult to get the amount of stuff for the rage room. It's difficult to get the amount of stuff uh, for the cell. There are people that have rage rooms that don't have junk removal businesses, but they spend a lot of their time actually trying to get, this, to get the items to get removed. What you want is you want a junk removal business that's so busy, it supplies your rage room, where all you have to do in the rage room is just get it set up and have somebody that makes sure that uh, customers are putting on protective gear, being safe, so on and so forth. You need to collect money, and then you're gonna need to advertise the rage room. The nice thing about advertising the rage room, it helps out your junk removal business and vice versa. A rage room is a great way to get free press for your junk removal business. Now, again, guys, when we have one of these established, I've done my initial research on rage rooms and these stores and all, we've yet to run one. So uh, six months from now, when that's established and up and going, I'm probably gonna be able to give, in, give a lot more information on exactly how you execute that. 
But I, where I'm going is this is what we're working on now. Aaron, got anything at all? Okay. So, um, so one of the ways you need to really understand gross, gross sales is the net sales you have on your income and then what takes off of that income. So there's certain expenses that are gonna come off of that income. Number one, and it's one of the highest, especially when you first start, is advertising. It's that acquisition cost. What did it cost you to get that one customer? We did an episode a couple weeks back on customer acquisition costs. Again, guys, I would, I would check that out uh, for sure because if you know that one number and that one number works out to be profitable for you, then you're gonna be able to expand your business much quicker and much more profitably. So. Yeah, you're advertising, and that, that could be 25% first year. Once you're established, it could be 15% or under. Disposal fees. Uh, generally, around disposal fees, you're going to be somewhere around 10%, 8%, 12%, somewhere in that range, depending on your market and what your uh, your dump fees are. I'd like to see you at no higher than 10%. If you're higher than 10, you need to figure out is there something you can be doing in terms of more recycling, cost effectively to get those fees down. Chances are you just need to raise prices. Uh, payroll, if you've got two guys, if you're not on the truck, 30, about 37%, 37.5% to be exact, um, or 37%, 17 and a half if you are on the truck. Now you do need to factor in paying yourself, but figure about 37%, maybe 35% of uh, your income is gonna go out in terms of payroll when you got two guys on the truck you're paying. Uh, fuel, we normally see fuel somewhere between five and 7%, so we average it out at 6% of gross income. Vehicle wear and tear, I'd factor this at anywhere at somewhere around 3%, maybe as high as 5%. So especially as you start getting uh, older vehicles, this is gonna go higher. I really recommend, and this is a mistake we made, and we've got trucks, we've got several trucks on order right now getting brand new vehicles. We waited too long to add newer vehicles to supplement or replace older vehicles. So our repair expense is much higher. Uh, our, down, our cost of downtime is higher because we've got vehicles that are breaking down Every, every other week. Um, so, and, and not that we don't perform maintenance, we just got high, we got, we got high mileage vehicles. And, and that, that really hurts. So get those newer vehicles as soon as you can. Um, insurance, workers' cop insurance, automobile lux insurance, general liability, all of that factors in to your ongoing cost. Every single job, you have a percentage that goes to insurance, probably around 3%. Tools, miscellaneous expenses, so anything that you gotta buy, dollies, assuming you need to buy dollies, a lot of tools you can actually find on junk removal jobs if you hold on to them, shovels, brooms, rakes, all that kind of stuff. You're gonna get tons of these on just actually removing stuff from customers' homes. But Sawzalls, you're not gonna come across very often. You're gonna need Sawzalls, you're gonna need tarps, you're gonna need, um, need nice dollies, appliance dollies, wheelbarrows. Um, you know, some of the stuff you might come across from time to time, but we normally figure tools and other miscellaneous expenses, trash bags, gonna run about 2%. And then credit card fees, guys. Credit card fees, uh, we, we say 2%, it's normally a little bit less. Now you guys, that doesn't, that doesn't mean when you guys go out and you get credit cards, you're probably getting charged more. We get charged like 1.7% or something like that, but, but we do enough volume that we're able to get really, really cheap rates. Uh, a lot of you guys are probably paying 2.5%. Uh, on your credit card fees, but some people are paying in cash, some people are paying in checks, and that's gonna help bring that down to round two. So, you take all those expenses out and that's how you figure your net income. And your net ultimately is the most important, but when you first get started in business, I would mainly focus on the gross because sales solves everything. The more sales you have, the more potential you have to grow and expand your business. Your net, you need to figure out what the minimum amount is you, need, you can live off of. And everything above that goes back into your business in advertising, new equipment, um, hiring people, expanding, so on and so forth. You don't want to try and start maximizing that net until maybe year four, year three at the earliest. And, and then even then, guys, I would reinvest, try to reinvest as much possible back into your business. There's going to be a point where no matter how hard you try, you invest so much into your business that it's just puking money back out to you at a rate that far exceeds the amount you're putting back into it. And that, once that happens, that is when you know it's time to go into another market, another business, another investment, because right now you got a money-making machine.
and that no matter how hard you try and, and throw money back into it, it's it's bringing it back at a, at a multiple. Um, John D. Rockefeller, I, I've studied him quite often. Very interesting guy. Uh, those of you that don't don't know who J.D. Rockefeller is, he was the founder of Standard Oil Company. Uh, he is the richest man of all time once you adjust for inflation, and it's not even close. I think his his net worth, if adjusted for inflation, is like three hundred and fifty billion, uh, compared to Jeff Bezos, which is at a hundred billion. Um, he he once had a saying is after he made all this money, very ruthlessly, he's an extremely ruthless individual. Um, after he made all this money, he then became, as a lot of rich people do, extremely extremely wealthy people do, is they become very philanthropic. So they want to give away a bunch. He wanted to give away a bunch of stuff, and he said, I mean, he had a quote that says, "It gives me great stress every day knowing that no matter how hard I try and give away my money, it comes back in multiples that far exceed that." So basically. He is saying, it's a hell of a problem to have, I wish I had this problem, that no matter how hard and how much money he tried to give away, he could not outgive the earn. So he was out earning how much he could give and he was trying extremely hard to give. You get to your business where it is, no matter how much money you put back into it, it's spent more out, you get, you're, you're gonna go places that, that, that far exceed the dreams or at least equal the dreams that, that you have. Uh, as long as you recognize that situation, and if you're not content, you move on and 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 kind of further expand your business. So, you, the first thing you really got to do, you guys, you got to really believe it's possible. Set a goal to attain it. Believe it's possible. Always, always, always set goals. It's very common. One of the biggest issues people have, and I've been guilty of this before. You set a goal, you reach a goal, and you don't set new goals. As soon as you hit a goal, do a minor celebration. Like I'll be, you know, we just hit a goal today. YouTube. Hit a thousand subscribers on YouTube, which ain't, is piddly. It, it ain't, I mean, it's, it's nothing really. But it's a goal that we set uh, back when we were at 100 subscribers. We want to hit a thousand subscribers. So we're gonna do, we're gonna do a little bit of celebration, not much of one. And then we're setting the next goal, which is 10,000. And we're gonna put it. We're gonna put a time limit on it. Uh, Aaron, 10,000 a year. Can we do it? Yeah, let's do it. So uh, it's gonna require some big swings, which is good. That's the reason you want these really, really huge goals. Um, 10,000 subscribers by 319 of 2020. Let's put that on the on the board. We want 10,000 subscribers by 319 of 20. So uh, y'all, you hold us accountable if we don't hit it. But um, I, you know, I'd rather aim for 10 and, and wind up at eight than, uh, than 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 aim at two and and hit it. So um, it took us a year to get to a thousand. Matter of fact, just a little over a year, we're going to try and add 9,000 in, in a year. So those are the kinds of big goals you need to set. Those are the kind of milestones that you um, that you want to set. Uh, in order to achieve this level of growth and have a business where you're actually able to reinvest back into it, you got to have your prices high enough. Those of you guys that are trying to advertise on being the cheapest guy in town, it is a losing proposition. It's a race to the bottom. You're going to be hanging out with the slugs at the bottom of the market. You don't want to hang out with the slugs. You want to hang out with the lions at the very top. Now, that don't mean you're not going to be in some ferocious battles with lions. We just had an AdWords bidding war. Um, we just we just got over with uh, in, in our local market in Raleigh. Um, you're not going to beat us in AdWords. I will literally spend every penny I have to, to outdo you in AdWords. It's just not going to happen. So, um, you know, somebody came in and, and they were trying to challenge us. a fairly new company. And I told Shane, I was like, screw it. Put it at, I, I, you know, it was over $100 a click I was willing to spend. Just, just spend it. I don't care. Spend the money. Um, you know, to to attain that that position, some of you guys aren't going to be in that. And and when you get up and you start battling with lions, if you face a junk doctors in your market, and there are those around, then uh, one, if you don't have the assets to do it, which you probably aren't, then you don't fight that game. You find another way. If it's Facebook advertising, yard signs, whatever, you do whatever it takes to attain that level of success until you've got enough money coming in that you can get up there and you can spar with that line. And that's fun. I I enjoy the hell out of that bid more. So he was probably causing somebody great stress. I was like, man, I was like, man, we hadn't had a good bidding war. Aaron, would I say this or not? I said, you know, we hadn't had a good bidding war in years. And I was excited. I was like, Shane, give me an update. How are we looking? How are we looking? Man, I, I was psyched up. I was like, man, I want to spend some more money. And uh, it, it made me excited. I like that battle. And you'll get to the point once you have those assets that you can do that. And, and guys, that's just a matter of making money. You know, once you get once you get to that that level where you're in, where you have that income, you can do that. You can't do it when you don't have it. So you need to get those get those prices up. Advertise, advertise some more. Advertise even more. Keep right on advertising. If you do not get the word out about your company, nobody's going to know about you. Nobody's going to pay money for you. So posting Craigslist on the ads ain't going to cut it. If you're going to do that, then you're going to be somebody that. 
uh, well, let me, let me put it this way. If you want to achieve the level of success I'm talking about in junk removal, Craigslist ads are not gonna cut it. Facebook buy, sell, trade group groups, not gonna cut it. If you're happy and content with the level you're at, that's fine. I, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you, t technically success is, is once you've attained, uh, you know, uh, once you've met you, you kind of your goals and aspirations, and if your goals and aspirations aren't to grow a huge company, there's nothing wrong with that. And you probably want to disregard a lot of what I'm saying other than you really ought to try and revisit your goals and aspirations because there's awesome freedom to be had when you have a business that makes great money without you having to work it all the time. Junk Doctors makes me great money. I do nothing with the day-to-day -day of Junk Doctors. I got a bookkeeper in place. We got a call center in place that takes calls. I got We got managers in place. My business partner manages the day-to-day. -day. We got supervisors in place that manage the multiple locations. I work maybe three, four, or five hours a week on Junk Doctors and it's mainly just big planning. Um, looking at numbers, that sort of deal, and I makes, make a very good income off of it, which allows me to take that money and put it into really expanding JRA. And the next company that's related to JRA, that's, uh, we can't announce the name yet because it's not fully trademarked yet, uh, is going to be coming out. It's going to help really grow all types of service businesses uh, throughout the country. So track your numbers. I mentioned that before. Don't be afraid to borrow money, guys. Dave Ramsey, when it comes to growing a large business, uh, you might grow a large business listening to Dave, but it's going to take you forever. Uh, you might die first. So uh, there's a couple things we got to go after here, guys. If you want to look grow, grow a large business, um, you do need to be patient. I'm not telling you to be impatient because there's going to require some patience and some perseverance, but you can't wait forever to happen. The other issue is you'll never fully get a hold and get established in your business if you cannot do what your competition does. And a lot of times that requires spending more money. So don't be afraid to borrow money. Once you've gotten into business, you realize you got a good model, you realize your acquisition costs are where they need to be, and, and you realize there's some steps you can take immediately, adding more trucks and increasing your advertising to in turn get more business. And this is something that we waited far too long to do. Um, I mean, years, like up until recently. So um, you, you'll get to the point where you get so confident what you've got going on is correct go out and borrow as much money as you can as long as you're not at crazy interest rate don't go out and borrow money at 15 or 20 percent interest but if you can go out and get money at seven or eight percent maybe even ten percent uh, or five percent then go out and borrow it borrow that money once you have a proven mar uh, model spend it and you're going to find out you're going to find a way to make the payment you, you know just you'll find a way and if you have that mindset that's going to really allow you to do very 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 well the other thing is though guys you can't sit there and second guess guess this stuff once you get established and grow. That even occasionally will, will happen to me. You kind of second guess, hey, is this the right way to go? Is this gonna work out? And you gotta crush it immediately. So you have to completely disregard it and move on. If you let self-doubt self creep in, you're gonna to move too slow. You're not gonna be as committed to moving forward. You're never, gonna, you're never gonna achieve the level of success. And you might fail because of self-doubt. Self-doubt can actually bring on failure. The, 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 you're, you doubting your success, you thinking you might fail could very well bring on failure. Um, I saw a graphic recently, and it was it was so good. I actually I, I I got it on a canvas print. I just ordered it this morning on a canvas print. And it was a picture of a guy jumping off a cliff, and it, this was supposedly a, a, a quote from the founder of LinkedIn. I can't remember his name, but it said uh, it said an entrepreneur is somebody who who jumps off a cliff and builds an airplane on the way down. And in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, that's more or less the truth. But um, you know, there, there are ways to mitigate that. You know, there's, 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 there's ways to, when you jump off that cliff, to ensure that you have the tools necessary on you to go ahead and build that airplane. Um, you know, you don't want to jump off a cliff with, with, with no, with, you know, without, without any way to build that plane. So don't be afraid to spend money, guys. Again, you're never going to achieve. If you can't spend money, you're not going to make money. This is not going to happen. You're never going to save your way to wealth in business on your own uh, in any type of, any period of time. Those of you that try and do it, you're going to get disinterested and you're going to get discouraged much quicker. The nice thing when you're able to go and borrow money and you're disciplined with spending that money, that borrowing money, is uh, you see progress quick enough that it makes you feel feel good that you're heading in the right direction. The problem is when you're capital when you don't have enough capital, is it, things move too slowly. You don't see progress. You gotta prepare for winter. This business is a bit seasonal. You will stay busy through winter. It's not like landscaping that just totally stops. But uh, you know, you, you might do fifty percent of what you did in the winter once you get established. What'll happen is if you're in rapid growth mode, you'll actually outgrow the slowdown curve. So, you know, if you're growing at 30% month over month, 
I, well, that's that's probably high. But if you're growing it, uh, if you're growing at eight eight or ten percent month over month, then a lot of the slowdown you're going to get in winter, you're actually going to um, you're actually going to almost pace that. So you you'll see a little bit of a downturn, but not as much of a downturn as you might see once you're a bit more stabilized. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, when I talk about borrowing money, I don't know if I'd go out and borrow money in August or September because you know that coming around the bend, you've got that winter coming and that, that might hamper you. But, you know, come February, um, that, that's a good time to borrow because you know you're going into March, April, May. So right now in March, ideal time to borrow money uh, if you have a good proven model and if you're going to be able to uh, you, you borrow it. And that's going to force you to go out there and, and make the big swings necessary to really grow your company and grow your business. Um, I posted something, I don't know if some of you guys follow me on social media, I posted something I think on the Junk Removal Authority page. I know I put in one of the Junk Removal groups, the Junk Removal Summit, and it was a letter from a local entrepreneur here in North Carolina, Bob Luddy. Bob founded Captive Air, which Captive Air supplies 75% of the kitchen ventilation systems in a, restaurants in America. Um, the guy, I don't know, he's a billionaire several times over. He's also started a chain of private schools called Thales Academy in this area. There's probably 25 schools, and I think he's owns the majority of all of them. Uh, Bob Luddy is his name. And, and Bob issued an email, and it talked about, it was an awesome email. And it, again, it's something you check it out on the Junk Removal Authority Facebook page. If it's not on there, as soon as this episode's uh, over, we'll get it posted on there. It was an email, or it was a podcast he just recently did. It was a summary of that podcast. One of the things he talked about is the first nine years he was in business, he grew very, very slow. What happened in his ninth year is he finally got the guts and had uh, and was able to go out and borrow money, and he borrowed, borrowed a significant amount of money, which gave him the capital to further improve his product and also to get salespeople to further sell, sell his product. And that's when his business took off. And like I said, they have market cornered with kitchen ventilation. They have 75% of the kitchen ventilation market is captive, captive air. It's based out of Youngsville, North Carolina. The guy's name is Bob Luddy. He's probably 80 years old, still works. He's cut back from 100 hours a week to probably 70 hours a week. Um, uh, yeah, but, but uh, you know, it's a great, great read. So check it out on the JRA Facebook page. Don't get pulled in too many different uh, directions. He actually mentions this in his email. Specialize, guys. Guys, you're in the. If you're going to choose to get in the junk removal business, be in the junk removal business. Don't get into landscaping. Don't get into dumpster rental. Don't get into cleaning, moving, etc. Too soon. So there's no problem. If you want to expand out a junk removal company throughout the country, you're not going to want to add moving. If you look at one Andrew Got Junk, there's an example. Got Junk added moving like four years ago. They added you move me four years ago. And, before, and, and his painting franchise, I think he started six or seven years ago. That was the first time he got out of Got Junk. Got Junk had been open, um, started in 1989, this is the 30th year. Got Junk had been open like 20 or 25 years before he started another brand. He expanded that all the way out throughout the country, staying 100% focused on junk, or in his case, 100% focused on selling franchises and improving his junk removal brand. Um, those of you guys, and I know there's some of you out there that want to franchise. When you get into the fran when you start franchising your junk removal company, you're getting into another business. You are no longer running a junk removal business. You are running a, a franchise sales business. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Is that business will change as you go. That's a great direction to go in, though. So you're going to peak. Your 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 lo your company will peak at some point, and that's when you go into another service. You get into another area where you start franchising. Those are kind of your three options to have if you want to continue that growth trajectory. Again, guys, start with the small service area, work your way out, and um, and then realize, guys, if this is your first service business, you are going to make mistakes. You are 100% going to make mistakes. You need to forgive yourself and allow yourself to make those mistakes. If you don't make those mistakes, you're not going to be able to learn from them, and uh, you're, you're going to punish yourself. If you punish yourself every mistake you make, you're, you're not, you're, chances of you being successful in business are, are not very good. You don't want to repeat those mistakes, but you want to allow yourself to make those mistakes. Um, and if you do that and you just move on and you figure out a way to fix the problem, you're golden. And again, reinvest like crazy. Uh, one thing that Dave Ramsey does say that I like is he says, live like no one else today so you can live like no one else tomorrow. This 100% applies here. A little bit different of a um, approach than Dave recommends, but that saying certainly does uh, does apply. We got any questions? Awesome, guys. So uh, we're close to an hour in, so you will take any questions you have now. Yeah, so we got one from Three Little Birds Junk Removal, um, and he says, Junk Removal and cleaning can go hand in hand, though. I get quite a bit of business from customers looking for both services from one company. 
Yeah, I mean, junk removal and dumpster rental goes goes hand in hand. The issue is, is you're dividing your attention and your efforts into growing two businesses. And you generally will find that's going to, uh, when you split your efforts, it's going to prevent you from growing one business to be as large as it could be. I agree that those two pair well together. I just think you need to have one business. If it's cleaning, if cleaning was your primary business, freaking ride cleaning as hard as you possibly can um, and and grow it where you've got that money generating no matter how much money you put back in it's bringing you more out take that money to hire a general manager who can in turn run your junk removal business your GM focuses 100% on your junk removal uh, I would also in turn hire a GM that can then focus on your cleaning business 100% running the cleaning business and you're in the middle watching both and figuring out how you can cross sell you cross sell your cleaning customers to your junk removal business and your junk removal customers to your, to your cleaning business. If you do it too soon, what happens is you extend out the success or you might never attain the level of success you could have if, had you chosen to specialize in one thing. Uh, one thing I will say, and it's something I thought long and hard about when we started JRA, uh, a lot of people, they want to start a new business, but and, and they already have a successful business, they want to get into a new one. Oftentimes, your efforts and your investment and your dollars are better spent on your current business uh, rather than a new business and if you determine your current business no matter how much more you spend is bringing is giving you more that's when you go into secondary business or secondary market okay guys so hey listen so this has been about uh, how much money you can truly make in your junk removal business and and what I cover here might not be what you're after if you're after a decent income and a um, a quality of life where where you work when you want to you enjoy getting down the truck that's what you enjoy doing what I'm saying here throw these numbers out the window because those of you guys that want to get out there and you want to make fifty thousand dollars a year hauling junk doing it on your own being on the jobs meeting the customers uh, you like that relaxed environment and in a way that, that's a pretty relaxed environment uh, then your profit margin is gonna be a lot higher I would not spend as much money on advertising um, do your Craigslist do Facebook buy sell trade uh, do follow-up calls to your customers, kind of stay in touch with them, and you're going to build you a pretty good little decent business, and you can be a single truck operator going out there and just kind of enjoying life and make fifty thousand, makes maybe seventy-five thousand dollars a year doing it, and probably forty or say fifty percent, maybe sixty percent profit margins at that point. For those of you that want to really grow something large to achieve total freedom, when you're that guy making fifty or seventy-five on the truck, you don't have total freedom. If you quit working, if you get hurt, if somebody gets sick, and you have to take care of them, your income stops. If you're the other guy, and it might, it's going to require you to take risks, get a little uncomfortable, probably work more, more hours to build up that level of business, then in a few years gives you freedom, then great. You know, I, I think that's, that's the way to go. That's going to give you a better quality of life eventually, but you might put off that quality of life. To me, though, I, mean, I work a ton. I enjoy working. So I don't see it as, as hurting my quality of life, but somebody might. Um, you know, you got to make a choice which way you're going to go after. Making a great living. Being on the truck all the time and junk removal is totally possible, and they're running a, a, a pretty good sized business with multiple employees, multiple trucks, multiple crews, multiple multiple types of services, multiple areas, maybe franchising. That's also a great way to go that's going to give you true freedom 